Any additions and deletions to the agenda? Uh, I think I'll take that question. Okay. The board still wants it. Fine. Okay. Anything else? Uh, not for me. Anyone? Citizens' comments. Name, obviously. <laughs> My name is obviously? Yeah. <laughs> Tonight it is. Um, Roger Logan, Woodstock Village. Um, I have a suggestion to make to the board, um, and I spoke to Eric about it last week, and he was at least provisionally supportive of it. Um, I was struck in Eric's presentation about kind of the state of the state of Woodstock um, that there are potentially some unrealistic expectations around service requests to the town, things like filling potholes and, and things of that nature. And that seems to me a place where some getting some citizen involvement and obviously with the select board's approval um, would be helpful. So um, what I'm suggesting is, is to create a system for handling constituent service so that they can be managed more systematically, start to build up a database of how long particular efforts take, what kind of efforts are coming in, and to much more systematically track the resolution and outcome of, of things of that nature. Um, and so hopefully our staff can spend more time focusing on planning for the future and doing long-term projects as opposed to kind of putting out fires with, with uh, apologies to the people who actually do put out fires. Um, so, um, it's, it's, I think it's probably fair to say that there's never been a system in place for really tracking requests or even managing how requests come in. I might call Eric, I might call Ray, I might call Laura, I might call Susan, I might call Greg, um, which is obviously extremely inefficient and also allows things to get lost in the shuffle. So what I'd like to suggest is put together a small working committee, um, hopefully one that is small enough or unofficial enough that it doesn't have to fall under the public meetings law. Um, but that's obviously not something I understand well enough to say one way or the other. Um, to start working on putting together a program to implement a systematic approach to managing constituent requests. Um, I would start by researching automated systems to manage this um, and, and um, after speaking to Eric about it, he said one thing that might be helpful is just for someone like me or, or other folks who are interested in taking this on, do the actual work of, of looking at different systems. There's probably hundreds out there. It's essentially a help desk, desk system that you would use for IT or, or anything else. I'm sure you used a work order system of some kind when you were grounds, when you were managing a physical plant. Um, that should include a customer self-service function so that it's online so that most requests could come in through a web form and then as as you set that up that the that the requests are categorized um and then ideally as much as possible those are self-assigned to the correct to the correct person if it's if it's something to do with public works, it goes to the public works person. I imagine that's the majority of the requests that come in of that nature, um, but that kind of remains to be seen. Again, I don't think there's a lot of data behind, out there at the moment about what comes in and how it gets resolved because it's all on an ad hoc basis. Um, then that should have some management reporting built into that. So if you have a, a, um, a customer service contract essentially that all requests get answered within 21 business day that you can see that flagged on a management screen that that has not been asked, uh, addressed which is not to say solved obviously because some things might take days or weeks to solve um and that it be multi-channel that it be something you could manage from your phone it'd be something that you could do online 
ideally that given the given our population here that that could also include a call center function of some kind um, but again something that could be automated that was menu driven so that those things could go right into the pipeline and get routed correctly um, so then based on that then select an automation system um, and then create and implement a public communication strategy to say this is happening these are the this is the way that this is going to work. And then going forward, here's what's going to happen. Um, I had originally considered setting up a kind of service standards for like if a pothole gets filled, you decide how often, uh, how many days does it really take under normal circumstances to fill potholes? I actually talked to John Spector about this today, and he had a good idea that we don't have the data to make those kind of determines, determinations yet. But if we get a system like that, this in place, the data that we can generate from that, plus talking to the staff who actually manage, who actually do the on the ground work, would then allow us to kind of start setting up and communicating to the public what the standards for for um, response time are for any given request. Um, so if there's agreement that this is a worthwhile effort, I'd be happy to take it on in terms of chairing whatever like two or three citizens um, would be interested in this. I don't know if a board member being, being on a group like that turns it into a, a public meeting thing or not. But so what, you know, when you consider this, um, just let me know and I'll be happy to start, you know, the first thing I would do is, is kind of agree with Eric on a set of requirements for an automated system and then just go out and start looking for them. And like I say, there's probably there's probably hundreds of systems out there. Hopefully, some really cheap ones because we're not, you know, we're not managing New York City here. So, okay. Thank you. Thank you, Roger. Yeah. Roger, as always, I really appreciate your enthusiasm um, and your engagement. Um, I, as someone who used Boston 311 excessively when I lived there. I'm always appreciative of self-service portals. Um, I think the thing to balance, and, and I'm sure you're aware of it, is that this doesn't become, you know, if, if we look into things, that the tool doesn't become the thing people, another thing people are frustrated with in their quest for right. service. And I think, um, I think that, yeah, I think that's that's a, a, a probably just like the first concern I have. I think that it'd be great to have a system that people can see and it's accessible. I would also say like, given what I know about people who live here, there's also something that's very gratifying about being able to pick up the phone, talk to the person as time consuming as it takes. I would love to automate as much as we can, obviously for right. efficiency's sake. Um, but I think that there's there's something to be said about people being able to call Eric's office and get Eric as, again, as inefficient as that is. Um, but I do think that there's a, a large discrepancy between like expectation and um, what we are reasonably able to offer right. and, and figuring out how to bridge that gap is really important for uh, satisfaction within our community. So I really appreciate you coming with the suggestion. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, having lived in New York and extensively used the 311 system there, it was meant to avoid doing anything by the city. Yeah. <laughs> um, there's no question about it in my mind. It was just a way of deep sixing any kind of requests. Um, I think it's doable. Absolutely. Um, it is nice to be able to call Eric or Mark, you know, but I know I wasted Mark's time two or three times, and it was a very inefficient way of getting of getting something done. Yeah. Um, and Eric and and whomever is in charge of any department should be concentrating on long term stuff and and structural stuff as opposed to dealing with the nitty gritty. It's nice, but yes, obviously the customer, the communications part of this is key. If if it doesn't work then the entire effort is wasted and it's going to take some structural organization within the, the way the town works as well you know there's there's a decision tree 
where does this go? And those decisions all have to be made. You can't, you can't automate a non-existent system. Right. So that's, that's all, that's all part of it as well. But I think it's worth doing. Um, if we can get our town staff people working on things they should be working on, as opposed to answering me on the telephone again. Yeah. And I think there is something to say. And you all too. I mean, yeah. that's. And I think there's something uh, about telling people about the work that gets done that they don't see too, you know, right. like yeah. we pave X amount, X miles of sidewalk. We did fill X many potholes, like having that data could be really valuable for that satisfaction. Yeah. Um, so. Yeah. And you have to tell people, like you said, reasonable expectations. If like our staff is a finite Pretty staff sure. and I mean, even our trucks are probably finite. You know, you can't fill two potholes at once if there's only one truck that can fill potholes. I mean, I don't really know how that works. I'm sure you do, but um, so yeah, that's that. It, it rises or falls just like anything else we do on how well the communication works. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, and maybe there's something, but not to bring David back into this conversation, but certainly we do know for the police and fire department, like how those categories of calls the breakdown of the categories of calls throughout the year, what calls are sorted to which category, like what's a... Yeah, and I assume that's because there's some automation in that system. Um, I don't know that, but I assume there is. Yeah. The 911 system. Thanks. So I'll just say two quick things on this. Uh, Roger did come to me last week and I appreciate him coming forward with this idea. It's what we want to see with our residents coming with solutions uh, as much as they can. So I want to appreciate him coming in also volunteer to take this uh, potential task on. Um, as always, staff time is limited. So something Roger and I talked about was how to do this and limit the upfront staff time. Uh, and something we'd probably still work on to figure out how best to do that. Um, another thing I, I early on looked at using a C clicks fix, which we use in Salem, Massachusetts which is a uh, system where residents can kind of take a photo of something and send it directly to the town. And then we kind of go through, prioritize it. And then you'd have the data afterwards that over the course of a year, you had 18 potholes, you had et cetera, et cetera. Um, we weren't fully, uh, they didn't have the staff capability at that time, i.e. some of our staff and DPW do not have cell phones. Mm -hmm. um and so we have to provide them with cell phones so they have the ability so it, it was a little back and forth when we got to and then the flood happened and you know it kind of went away um but also i think this is a great and this may not be roger's idea but having this information if we actually could be successful in this and then show it to the residents saying like your tax dollars currently fund this service time if you say you want more that might mean hiring two more dpw staff so are you okay with your tax going up 3% more, so a pothole goes in five days or three days. Mm -hmm. uh, so it could be a good visual exercise too to kind of visualize how much things cost and what that means. I know when you talk to people in the village and they talk about the police budget and you say, okay, step one is not have 24 hour coverage. And they say, well, we need 24 hour coverage. And that's why we have the staff and we have. So it's a good vis a visualization for people to kind of see taxes for a service, so. so um, I know he was just here, but does um, Hanover use something, a tracking system? I can I can figure out, yeah. Okay, yeah, maybe that could be, but yeah, I, I would be interested to know. I'd be shocked if the town said Hanover is not. Yeah, I using something, yeah. I think there's other issues that people will have to call about too. Someone recently called me about, you know, who do they call to get a permit to have a food truck? And I yeah. actually didn't know which department or so I just gave them the town hall number. Yeah. So, you know, those kind of calls that would be great if there was a way they got grouted for it. Yeah. Okay. Any other citizens comments? Hey. Okay. okay. Um so you'll see there's no um, financial update um, right now. That's because two reasons. One, we're three weeks into the new fiscal year, so uh, we haven't had a payroll completed yet. Uh, we only had about one warrant done for FY25. Um, FY24 is done, closed. 
Uh, we're just doing some adjustments in the back end to move money around accounting wise to do the right adjustments for we close the fiscal year. So once we've done that, I will have a update for the board and what the surplus is. Uh, we're hoping it'll be pretty good. Uh, we will carry the FEMA uh, expenses over into the next fiscal year. Um, but I believe all but one project has been obligated now by FEMA, uh, which means we should get the full amount in uh, probably the next coming months. So that'll be something good to look forward to. Um, kind of on uh, Roger's conversation a, a bit more, um, our DPW is currently short staffed. Um, luckily we haven't had any floods. We haven't had any major issues, uh, but working about two people down. So we all look for new employees, but also service time has, uh, increased overall just because of not having full staff there. Uh, so again, I asked the public's uh, patience when it comes to, uh, concerns of, uh, issues involving our public works department. Um, what else do I want to talk about? Um, the board got an email or a from me. I'm going on vacation, uh, starting midday this Thursday uh, through the following Sunday. Um, Chief Green will be the interim town manager from then until the following Thursday when he's on vacation, uh, at which point uh, I'll, I'll take back over the responsibilities for the last days of my vacation uh, in case anything happens. Uh, I'll just be in Massachusetts on an island, but I'll be reachable uh, besides the ferry ride across. Um, I want to welcome uh, Kitty Mayor's Corps to our um, town hall. Uh, this is our third week in. For any of you who've been on the website, you've seen the work she's done and updating the website. Uh, she's been doing the minutes for the select board, trustees, joint boards, and starting to do all the minutes for the plan zoning committees as well. Um, so she's been doing a good job so far and just want to welcome aboard. Um, I want to make an announcement that. Um, Stephanie Applefellow will be moving from plan zoning over to uh, to be my chief of staff uh, going forward. Uh, it's effective yesterday. Um, she's going to stay in plan zoning uh, for a little while to kind of help them with the transition, especially with short-term rental stuff happening. Uh, but once she's over uh, on my office full-time, she's going to be taking on some of these projects, like Roger mentioned, bigger projects being on the community, really trying to fit the pieces all together and make sure we're all working as, as efficiently as possible. Um, being someone that can take on some of my tasks day to day, work on those, uh, but really just find ways to make sure we're communicating better internally and externally. Um, she's excited to, for the change, so am I. So I think it'll be something uh, positive for the community as a whole. So looking forward to that happening. Um, and then finally, uh, about two hours ago, I got uh, positive news from the State Department. Uh, we've been approved to host a fellowship from a uh, uh, planning zone expert from Indonesia is going to be coming over and working with us from about mid-September through mid-October uh, to the ICMA, which is the International uh, City Management Association, which I'm a group of. Um, so every year they allow a few candidates to kind of apply to come to different countries and kind of work in their municipality for a month or so. This person is coming over an expert in planning and uh, sustainability and uh, economic development. Um, so that got approved this afternoon, pending finding housing in Woodstock, which is uh, a common for any worker who wants to be here. Uh, luckily, ICMA is working on that front, not us. So as, as soon as they have housing set up, uh, we'll make that official. And that could be a good experience for them and Woodstock as a whole. So I'm excited for that as well. Um, and that's all I have. Any questions? I would say just a reminder about the informational meeting next week. Oh, yes. Um, so uh, Thursday, the 25th is the um, informational session for the short-term rental ordinance. Um, it'll be a public meeting held here by the select board uh, to go over what's in the new ordinance, what's in the old ordinance, what hasn't changed, um, and then to answer any questions the public has uh, leading up to the Australian ballot vote on July 30th uh, from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. And a reminder, if you're a village resident, you can vote in the town election and the village election as well. So uh, you can vote twice. Uh, so that'll be great. Um, and then um, the neg neg negotiations with the uh, what's like Aqueduct Company is still ongoing. We're hoping to have an announcement very soon about the status of that as well. Okay. Hey, we're, we're
first thing that on the agenda is uh, ambulance write-offs. Uh, so this is a, a yearly process for um, bills that have been paid. Uh, before we go into it, I just want to make a point that um, in the FY25 budget, the select board decided to increase the amount budgeted for this amount. Um, in the past, uh, we've always underfunded this. Um, for this fiscal year, we have $90,000 budgeted. Uh, we're looking at a write-off of $73,000. So for the first time, I think in a long time, the board has actually over-budgeted, which is a good thing, um, instead of budget budgeting to um, kind of alleviate some more burden on the residents. So um, one good side on this, that we did our job correctly and made sure we had enough money uh, in this account. I'll turn it over to the board for a bunch of questions. Sure. Yeah, Corey has a, a note here about um, taking a more active role in collections. I, David, I wonder if you have any thoughts about that. She wants to. Well, no, not that she that that we sorry that we as a town David, take a more active role in in bill collection for ambulances for ambulance bills. It is a lot of money. Yes. So uh, ambulance collections, let me just uh, start back. The reason the bill has gone up in 2017, I believe, we increased our rates substantially. And that ended up with an increase on write-offs. So there's a direct correlation between an increase of rates and an increase of write-offs. Um, that being said, we make phone calls, we send letters that, uh, up to three times each. I don't know what more we could do to uh, gather more more of those funds back. If you have ideas, I'm willing to listen, but it takes man hours that we really don't have. Yeah. I'm just wondering if maybe in the first letter you sent a payment plan or the second letter you sent a payment plan. We do. We offer them. We offer all kinds of ways to work with them. Uh, we'll do 10-year payments, We'll whatever it takes. Um, some people take us up on that. Some people we never hear from. Um, I think Laura and I were talking a few months ago about trying to find ways to send different types of letters for, I think, doing your taxes. Um, so we also talk about if we send a different form letter from my office, something else would that have more sway or something, we try those options as well. But I think what the chief's saying is correct is it also comes down to staffing time sure. and, and concerns and, you know, I mean, seventy-three thousand dollars is not a lot, you know. So, you know, option is that we could hire a part-time person or pay someone part-time to dedicate their time to this, and maybe we waste thirty thousand dollars on someone to make sure we're not writing off seventy thousand dollars or something. And so, those options as well, you know. But and I think it's it's standard that these bills are soft bills. So I'm wondering if, since you've heard of what other departments do, so that they're not everybody soft. Everybody soft. Bills. The reason is that they don't want to go after their taxpayers with collections. It, yeah. it would be an extreme anomaly. Okay. okay. Thanks. So is there a motion to move the ambulance right off of $73,396.05? Is So moved. For a second. Second. All those in oh, Wendy has her hand up. I know you're kind of in the middle of a motion, though. You may want to. Okay. Um, yeah, I think her, well, you already made the motion for her hand went up. So. Okay. Oh, all right. Um, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Wendy, do you want to make a comment? Thank you. Yes. Thank you, Eric. Um, it's this this uh dialogue just prompted a question. I've recently. <laughs> join the um the the uh, members of medicare and i'm wondering if the people that don't pay their bills are waiting for insurance payments and the confusion of when it takes a long time for those to come through and i don't know how that plays in to ambulance fees but it's just a thought about why things fall through the cracks um the billing process for insurance is very cumbersome um, it's just an observation and so, sort of a question, but um, it's just uh, 
if that helps the quest. It's just I wanted to throw that in the pot. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Okay. Um twin road upgrade. Don't hear talk about twin road. That's you. That's yeah. you. Oh. <laughs> I thought so. <laughs> um, so I think we wanted a few of you to go out, Chris Barr to go out. Uh, Chris Barr was okay with everything. Um, I think Chief Green, you have any concerns? No, I was uh, told the building will be sprinkled. sprinkled. So basically we just went over where the culverts were gonna go and they were gonna be town specs, which I think was 18 inch. And staying in the same runoffs is uh, where the water runs off now. Um, and the only other thing was uh, the snowmobile trail on that shared portion of it. Um, Which you and I, we walked. I, I, I reviewed the far section with the owner. Yeah. He liked your idea, stay in the field and go out in that far away. Okay. And then I flagged the rest, which is because I took your advice and it was just brush. Got one pine like this and a couple little trees for the rest of the vast trail, but so it, it's along and it skirts up and you just what you pointed and it comes back down. But we definitely will provide. He was okay with all that. He was okay with all that. Absolutely. He he wanted a less. Ex he didn't want. He agreed with you. I spend a lot of money on taking down those big white pines along, right ten feet away from that wall. And then the only other thing I think it's twelve foot is the width. Mm -hmm. They've raised the grade up. Um, this is for the vast trail. No, I'm talking on the oh, town back road. to the town road. I'm fast trail is going to be off that section exactly of class four. It's just going to cross it as far as the town goes. Um, road goes is up to where it used to be. Yeah, right. And it's only going to end, end up being 12 feet wide, approximate. Is that right? I heard that figure road surplus and ditches, right? Exactly. Yeah, and pull offs. Yep. And you, there was a concern that uh, the new logging landing put some water onto the town, and that's, right. that's that something that every, everyone's aware of and knows how to fix it. Yeah. So Chris was okay with all those um, changes. Yeah. If they do that, like they, I think there was a plan on that, was there not? Excuse did, me. Did Brad have a plan? Oh, for sure. The plan section, putting uh, that right. Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Which one is it? This one. But I would 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 you like me to provide to the full size? You might want to. I mean, just so we you can eyeball it and see that it's what yeah. you guys talked about. Yeah, bring it up. I think that would be valuable. <clears throat> That's the existing, the end of the class three road. Mm -hmm. And this is their proposed um, updating the class four road to here to here. Yeah, exactly. Up, and, and then all that, sir. And, right. then, and then providing this uh, fast. And here, this is what this does does that and comes out, which is, you know, there's no trees. It's right on grade. There's no cutting. It's just better, which Greg pointed out. And Greg, I think this just this does this between my two fingers, the vast trail, it's slightly very variant from that. I don't think that to to uh, really to 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 basically you take yeah. your advice, you know, better better track. And and do you have turnouts here for the fire engine or fire trucks as well? Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. So it will be tight up there, but a lot of other roads are the same thing. They're up they're upgrading it, so. I think it's a plus for us, actually. Class four rows. Chris had no problems with it. Chris didn't have any problems with it. If we were, what we discussed, we just wanted to move the. Uh, Chris was the public works. And gotcha. We Thank you. With, Thank uh, you, Brad. Brad. Yep. Um, and myself. Um, and it was just brought up to get the snowmobiles off from that road be a safety thing, and the owners offered to do that. Um, I don't have a problem with it. So. Right. 
Uh, We're looking for a motion to upgrade yeah. to approve the upgrade of correct. Yeah. Quinn or Long Quinn, Quinn, Quinn Road. Quinn Road. Okay. I would move that we approve the upgrade of Quinn Road as depicted on the Brad Ruderman survey. There a second. All second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Very good. Hey, thank you. Would you like full copies of all this stuff or? I think the town should have. Yeah, well, yeah. I think well, I'll take a copy. This is the plan. And these two are the text. <laughs> Thank you. Hey, Next is the Fallen Road Foliage Closure. Sure. What's your name? Michael Doughton, 3488 Cloudland Road. I'm actually a Pomfret residence, but uh, representing the whole neighborhood of uh, Pomfret and Woodstock. Cloudland Road and Barber Hill. Obviously, what happens on Barber Hill doesn't affect Woodstock, but the uh, Woodstock end of Cloudland Road is what we are proposing for closure identical to last year. This is the fall foliage closure uh, due to the social media influencers and TikTokers and everybody that comes up and floods the area around uh, Sleepy Hollow Farm, uh, especially during uh, indigenous people holiday weekend, but also the weeks surrounding it. And what are the dates this year? Um, the dates this year, the I proposed slightly extended dates because they pushed the holiday, either pushed the holiday back or it just falls very late this year. Um, but the conference select board balked at that a little bit. They thought four weeks was excessive. So they're talking the 25th of September through the 16th of October. Let me double check that, make sure the 25th is the right date. And I, I know Ben Burke is on. Uh, did the Pomfret vote for this last night? Are they voting for tomorrow night? Tomorrow night. Yeah, September 25th through October 16th. <laughs> and all the park residents are on Holland Road in favor of this? Again? Yes. Yep. Yeah. Basically, we did a survey at the end of the at the end of the closure, overwhelmingly positive, overwhelmingly wanting to do it again this year. We're hoping that two years is enough. Um, I have thoughts about how we might scale it back next year if we do it again or whatever, but um, it was very effective last year, and I think we've got to do it at least a couple years to somehow deal with this but can i ask a few questions yes. to, to ben ben are you there yes hi good evening can you introduce yourself and your role yes uh, my name is benjamin brickner i'm chair of the pomfret select board and a pomfret resident um are you guys doing the same thing with a detail from the sheriff this year uh, yes, although last year we had eight hours per week on average under our contract. The contract this year has been expanded somewhat, um, but we are looking to only assign about 60% of our hours this year, which will allow some patrol time elsewhere in town. Um, but same concept, just a slightly lower commitment on the contract to patrol hours this year. And all you'd require from Woodstock is the barriers down at the bottom of the road? That's right. The barriers at the bottom of the road uh, at River Road and also uh, just the opportunity to coordinate with you and your uh, road crew teams uh, when the closure is in effect. I could clarify one thing. The residents will be paying for the police coverage as we did last year other than what the, the town is covering. And as Ben just mentioned, the town is covering a, a bit of it, but we'll be covering the predominance of the of the uh, coverage for both the sheriff and for a private patrol on the Barber Hill side. Uh, Chief Green, do you have a second? Do you mind coming up? I have a quick question. Being a steps in today. <laughs> you, you're in beach in a week, make sure you look good. Um, are you aware of any issues with any of your crew or the police who try and get up 
uh, Cleveland Road last year during the blockage? No, we had no calls over there. We make a pretty uh, staunch memo on how to deal with it. Okay. And, uh, I, don't, I don't see any problems. Okay. Thank you. And to be clear, it's not actually physically blocked off for traffic, especially emergency vehicle traffic coming through. We made sure of that. There was some discussion about that early on last year before we actually did the closure, yep. but we never, nobody ever approved an actual physical barrier closing the road, and that didn't happen, and that's not going to happen this year. Okay. okay. Eric, if I if I may add very quickly, I, Mike's correct about the dates. The Pompert Select Board is proposing Wednesday, September 25 through Wednesday, October 16. That shifted back slightly from last year to pick up the Indigenous Peoples Day weekend, which rolled back a week, um, while still keeping the closure to about three weeks. We did feel the board felt that four weeks was just longer than we were comfortable closing a public road. And our next meeting is tomorrow evening where we're hoping to sign off on all the details and are hoping for your board's endorsement or approval of a closure during the same period. Okay. Questions? My comment was just about communications. I think, you know, making sure that we're letting residents know obviously ahead of time. I think this was a story that was picked up quite a bit and got a lot of traction last year for better or for worse. And so making sure we're giving folks a lot of uh, time ahead to clarify what's actually happening and what the closure actually means um, would be helpful. And, and if we need to coordinate with Comfort on that, that's we can do that. And and to be clear, the residents, our, our group of residents that's taken on the, the onus to make sure that that happens with the communication, with making sure that access is clear and what's gonna happen yeah. to, for all residents the area. I, I expect we'll take the same communication steps this year as last year, which included sending hard copies of the closure plan to everyone on the closure area of Cloudland Road, Barber Hill Road. We also placed an ad in the paper about a week and a half prior to the closure, and there were listserv messages both in Palm Britt and Woodstock, I think weekly, um, immediately before and during the closure. Obviously, the international news uh, attention helped our cause in getting the word out, but um, we think the messaging that we took uh, organically last year should do the trick, but are open to suggestions for any other steps you think Pomfret should take. I don't know if we have anything at this moment. I think last year we paid to have the sign up to kind of let buses know before they got past doing SARM. Yeah. So we can have Chris Barr look at the cost of that and bring it from the board uh, in August. Thank you. That's great. I, I know, just Mike's point about it being well received last year. That, that was my experience as well. Eric, I know you were at, and Susan, you were at the debrief session last year yep. and um, feedback was uniformly positive. And the, the ripple effect on tourism seemed to be minimal, if even heading in the opposite direction, according to the Chamber of Commerce. So uh, we're comfortable executing this again. We think it'll have the desired effect of enhancing public safety and improving quality of life for residents in the closure area. Thank you. Okay, is there a motion to approve closing of in road? Should we be doing that before the conference though? So, I mean, you can do either one. You can, it's, you can close your road um, by vote right now if you want, or you could close it with the um, caveat that Comfort does it tomorrow. It's, you can also close it if Comfort have a half hour and we could have our meeting in August and overturn the vote and not close it. So either way, I think it's fine. You asked the question. I know. Well, I, I guess I would move that we close the road um, consistent with conference action at their next meeting. Is there a second? I will second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Good luck. Thank you much. Thank you, Ben. Thank, Thank you. you, everyone. Thanks, Next so, is the five, five, Yep. Five. Chief David. Green's going four for four on the agenda. <laughs> Come on up. Um, so before David gets here, I just want to kind of preface this, and he'll probably say the same thing, but we're looking now at about a four-year period between ordering a fire truck and then it went delivered. So, and we pay on delivery as well, but, um, you know, 
just so we have an idea, this is not something that's coming tomorrow. It's going to be a long period. So um, this takes some kind of long-term thinking of how we want to do this. But turn over to you. Keep going. <laughs> Has that always been the case for long lead times? Or oh, no. So COVID changed the world uh, drastically. Uh, before, the average delivery time of a truck was around, give or take, 180 to 280 days. Um, our truck that we ordered, just received in 21, we ordered in 19. We paid um, around $750,000 for that. We also spec'd out a ladder truck at the same time, which was 900000 And you can see how much they are have gone up in five years. So, but it's time to replace some of our trucks. Woodstock has a 20 year replacement plan on fire trucks. We've never met that. Uh, but now we're, we're getting in the territory where the trucks are, be, you know, reaching 25 years in age. Uh, they need to be sent down the road. As Greg said, we do take really good care of them. Uh, we know they're all worth a lot of money. But uh, that being said, this week I've spent four thousand dollars on one truck in one week, um, and that's going to continue. Yeah. It, it's there's just no way around it. Um, but we have some choices here, and, and if you have a few minutes, I'll lay out the choices for you. Each engine two is our oldest truck. It's up to station two. Uh, miles really don't matter on these trucks um, because they're all relatively low mileage. Um, hours is high though. And being living in the rust belt, I mean, salt and, and working as a fire truck, water, things start rusting and we're having continue, continuous problems with that. That being said, our engine two, like I said, is up for a replacement. And we have two choices really for this truck in my mind um, that we replace engine two, but we also have an insurance problem and an OSHA problem. So ISO requires us, because of the number of commercial buildings we have at specific heights, to have a ladder truck. And when we lost our last ladder truck, it wasn't wholly the problem, but we lost one ISO point. And what that means is roughly $600 every six months increase in insurance prices to commercial buildings. And I get squeezed regularly by these guys saying, when are you going to redo your ISO points? And I keep saying, I'm not ready. I don't have the equipment. I don't have the stuff in place. We're working towards it, but it may be a while. The other uh, thing is residential insurance is uh, looks at a couple things, distance to a hydrant, distance to a fire station, and the amount of water we carry on our trucks to a structure fire. So engine two holds a thousand gallons. If we were just to get rid of that and buy a ladder truck, we lose 500 gallons of water. And that will significantly hurt residential insurance. If we keep engine two and don't get the ladder, we're in the same place with commercial insurance. I know this is no easy choice. You can see down below where I spec out what a used ladder would cost uh, 600000 and then we'd probably have to refurbish it. Uh, so you're looking at another 600000 or somewhere between three and six. Uh, factories no longer do refurb refurbs because they're so far behind in truck rebuilds. Uh, the big one at the bottom of that paragraph is OSHA is looking at a standard to come into effect the end of this year that says you can only have a truck that's 15 years old, refurbish it, you get to keep it for 10 more years, then it's gone. And more than likely, that is going to happen. We're in public comment now, fire departments are squeaking a lot, but OSHA does what OSHA does. And nice. they, quick question on that? Yes. The engine two is 1999, so it's 25 yes. years right now. Yes. So if this OSHA thing passed, We'll be in the tomorrow. That that truck cannot be used anymore. Oh, well, we got to use it, but we're going to cross our fingers. Nothing happens. Yeah. Yes, uh, our insurance company offers our OSHA audits, our OSHA programs, so there is no way to sneak around this. Uh, Southwood Stock's going to have the same problem. Um, I'm ask you how the stock. Yeah, it doesn't matter if you're volunteer, municipal. Uh, the only ones that get out of this are the feds. 
So and how do the, I, I don't know the age of the Southwood stock trucks, but I I'm wondering how they fit into your plan of, of needs. I, I don't know, but we count that water supply as our water supply and we're allowed to. So we hope they can keep rolling. Uh, adding a ladder truck to the fleet, as I put, uh, ISO requirement right now as we sit, safety to our members. Should we have to bail out of a building, safety to the public? Should we have to rescue them? And then it's multi-use fires, rescue, rope rescue, et cetera. So you can see, I, I hate to be the bearer of bad news here, but my suggestion is we buy a new engine and a new Quint and go back to the fleet that we used to have. We have room for these? Sure do. Yeah, once we build it, uh, station three. No, I'm just messing with that. <laughs> so that's in the back, actually, if you turn the page. Uh, I just ignored that one. <laughs> um, <laughs> engine two, we, we, is it worth keeping? No. No, I mean, it's, it's right now, today, I put an estimate at 25,000. When we traded in engine one in 2021, the dealer offered us 7,500. I was say these numbers in four years aren't going to yeah. be. Yeah. So if we were to keep it, I know what you're saying, but then we're possibly not going to be able to meet OSHA requirement. We'll have to do a refurb on it, spend anywhere from three to 600,000. So, but would that be worth it for, say, South Woodstock? So, Greg, do you mean buying these new engines and keeping engine two as well? Okay. Yeah. It, if it's only worth a thousand, I don't even think it'll be worth that, Greg. Can we refurbish it and use it at another? It depends what the OSHA rule does. Because if o, if the OSHA rule meets what they want, it has to go down the road. No questions. What would they not? What rules would it not meet? A uh, truck can be fifteen years old. You get rid of it, or you do. One refurb and you get ten more years out of it. Well, that would Period. Be. But the, so, that's so we're at year twenty four right now. Because if anyone, I mean, the, the problem is if anybody got hurt on it. Yeah. And if it doesn't meet OSHA, we'd be in yeah. trouble. Yeah. Yeah. So I know it's a lot to think about. Uh, the two quotes on there: new engine of a uh, one point one nine four is without trade-in, without our loyalty stuff. I suspect we'd be in the 900, 850 range. Um, and the Quint ladder, I'm not really sure, but I would suspect that would be in the 1.55. 1 so these are guesstimates, but. Two questions for you. One, if you had to choose one option, one truck, you choose a ladder truck. Yeah. Um, and then if we made this order today, the price gets locked in the day of the order. Okay. As far as I know, unless COVID or some other monkey pox comes, who knows? But we should be locked in. Have we? I could probably pull up financials, but I have no clue where they are. Uh, have we been putting aside for any of these? Do we have any money in the bank? No, you guys cut my capital budget last year. Um. I have I have roughly eighty five thousand dollars saved up for a, a fire truck. I think you got to beat these guys up on the price a little bit. Greg, I'll, you take a ride with me. We'll get some Coors Light. And so we'll go hit them hard. Well, that's your first mistake. <laughs> <laughs> Jack Daniels. Um, wow, these prices are crazy. Yeah. Yeah, but you can see in, in four and a half, five years, they doubled. Yeah. So I know we don't know have the funding right now. I know everything's up in the air, but if we're going to do this, it'll take me six to seven months even to get ready to order if you say yes today. So we have, do we have estimates or just? Now, these are back of the napkin from uh, the people that I get the trucks from now. Um, but we've got to spec the truck out how we want it. So the ladder truck, we're actually pretty close because we did that recently in 2018, 19, and we'll probably copy engine one's recent pur purchase to some degree, um, but it's still going to take six months for the factory to get the quotes, to build, you know, to do all their CAD drawings. So I'd be, I think we'd be lucky to be able to 
sign a contract with the first of the year. We'd be darn lucky. I'm curious as to what OSHA's requirements are going to change, what what exactly they are. Yep, so I, can, I have a, a four-hour-long presentation. So basically what they're going to do is uh, NFPA now is the standard across the board, and towns can choose to follow that or not follow that. OSHA hasn't touched the fire departments in 45 years, pretty much stayed away. They said, all right, we like NFPA. You now have to follow NFPA, no questions asked. So it, it's going to be more than just fire trucks. It's going to be new gear, radios. There is, I mean, this is the bottom of the you know, tip of the iceberg of their trucks or the big equipment, and then there's going to be trickle down all the way down. NFPA to the is what? National Fire Protection Association. Yeah. So there's, a, like I said, there's a lot of squeaking. I met with Bernie Sanders people last week and had a conference call with them. And um, now they're doing what they can. They got attached to one of his bills. He's really miffed about that. Um, but like he said, OSHA's going to do what OSHA does. They'll play, they'll play nice, let you weigh in on public comic, but more than likely they're just going to shove this through like they do every other OSHA standard. So I think it'll put a lot of towns in jeopardy, smaller towns, uh, South Woodstock, Bridgewater, the Parfits, that can't even come close to afford this. By thinking, how can they, because they, if they can't afford, these departments can't afford it, what are they going to do, close them? Well, no, there's a thing called regionalization, and I'm ready to pounce. I've been working for it on years uh, with other departments. And if they start to close, we'll be there to to help assist towns maintain fire protection. So just financially quickly, um, one, in the past, we put away $20,000 of fire trucks. Uh, David uh, asked for 50000 this year. We gave him 35000 so that thirty-five thousand, they have about eighty-five thousand dollars in capital reserve um, as of right now. Um, if you put fifty thousand away for the next four years, you get to about almost just under three hundred thousand uh, dollars. But you'll be looking at about a three million dollar for two purchases. So looking at about if you do a twenty-year bond, one hundred fifty thousand dollars a year um, before interest on that. So you probably need to get about up about two hundred thousand a year. So. Um, we're behind the ball, frankly, for, for reserves. Um, so when it comes to finances, we'll have to be creative and it's going to take a chunk out of our operating budget going forward. Um, one way or the other. We put a surplus, some of the surplus, is that? Uh, potentially if we want to, yeah. In quite all honesty, the best thing we can hope for is regionalization. If we can be a pivot point in that for surrounding towns. And the upfront cost, but we'll be able to put that money into the back end. And having, I assume, a ladder truck, a new ladder truck would be a better, better selling point for realization if you have. Yeah. So uh, I think as Chief Gearing said, I, I don't know if we have to decide tonight, but we can kind of try to run some numbers internally if the board wants to give some guidance on what they want to see. I can have uh, Robert look at some numbers. Uh, so with uh, Chief Green kind of go over some options. Um, what it's going to look like. Well, I think he knows better than what we and us what he needs. So it's firefighting, yes, but I hated to bring this to you because I like to be fiscally responsible as I can. Uh, we're in kind of a pickle over this. I know it's not easy, some tough calls, and we do what we have to do, Ray. My suggestion was, would be to look at both vehicles. Do we need a motion? Do we need, do you... I mean, you need a motion if you want to actually vote on purchasing them forward. To, to look at them, you don't need a motion. You can tell me to do a thousand things and we'll, we'll do it on the back end. Is there, is there a, a deal for, is there a discount for buying both of them? Oh, trust me. We'll get a discount. Okay. I'll even make sure you get a, a fire truck hat out of the right. deal. <laughs> um, <laughs> Chief, is there a way that you could... Um, Go back to them and say the board's interested in purchasing potentially two vehicles, which you want, and see what the actual quote would be. Or is that not not until we build it? Okay. So we have to spec them out, and then the 
manufacturer will say, this is what you want, and we'll say yes, and they'll say this is what it costs. X, uh, based on, and again, it's very new to the fire truck building process, but uh, are the specs stuff that like we say based on like our needs as a community we need, and are there ranges of specs like when you order like the baseline of a car versus like the really high end finishes and is there movement there between like what's a nice to have and what's a yes. nice to have? Absolutely. So uh, while I would always love the Cadillac version, no. Cadillac, okay. we never get that, but we never buy the Pinto version either. Oh. We're somewhere in between. Okay. Uh, what will happen is last time when we were ready talking about the other ladder truck, I called around and Burlington was like, hey, we're buying two. So I went in. So we were able to get it a little cheaper. I'll do some of that this time. Okay. I mean, if I have to call Boston Fire, we'll, we'll get in on somebody's yep. purchase. I'll drive down with you. Yeah, yeah to get save it. money. Okay. Uh, so we'll, we'll do all we can to save money. And we may not get the exact truck we want, and you may not get the exact price mm -hmm. you want, but we'll find something in the middle. Okay. I have a question. Yeah, uh, right, right to me. <clears throat> That's the hot seat. <laughs> so, I mean, this is really a question for, for Chief Green. Um, obviously, we're talking a lot of money here. Um, and there's obviously externalities that are driving a lot of this decision. Um, and I love the idea of regionalization. And I, I think it would be great to go in that direction. And being a larger town in the area, we would obviously be better positioned I, I just have a question. Looking at the annual report, we had one building fire in 2023, mm -hmm. according to the annual report. We had three chimney fires, three brush fires, and three motor vehicle fires. Are we driven to buy these trucks, to, to buy something like, and there's, you know, there's a lot of other calls where you do a lot of other stuff that may not need a pumper truck or a ladder truck. Are we driven by these externalities that we have to have this equipment, even though it might be more efficient to buy another like off-road vehicle to fight brush fires or things of that nature? Are we just locked into buying this equipment or this kind of equipment? Or or is there an opportunity to to adjust our equipment to deal more with the problems that, that we actually are dealing with on a daily basis? I mean, I'm sure a lot of you what you do is medical or otherwise. If I can up, happy day. <laughs> so the way we deal with our equipment are a couple of ways. We have standards, i.e. what protects us firefighters. We have the assurance company, and then we have what the town actually requires. So what the town actually requires, you're right. The last few years, structure fires have been really low. Uh, fire prevention has been great. We hope to continue that way. But we have um, what we call a high risk, low frequency, and then low frequency, uh, other way around, uh, high frequency, low frequency. Okay, we have to prepare for the low frequency, high risk, i.e. structure fires, um, you know, a car in the river, we have to prepare for that. That's what you pay us to do because we're gonna look pretty foolish if your building's on fire and we just stand around because we have nothing but ambulances. Um, and the insurance company pretty much feels the same way. So we're driven by those, those um, low frequency, high risk calls. And insurance company is the biggest driver of that. Um, so are our citizens' health and, and life safety. So while we may not, and we're lucky right now, don't have any structure fires, I'll use that one as our big one, um, we do have that. And I mean, whether it's in this town or Hartford or Lebanon, we go and our equipment helps them and they bring their, their equipment to us and we share resources, but we still have to protect our own town first by what is required, first and foremost, the life safety, then insurance, and then what actually we have. So I hope that kind of ans answers it. It's a little muddled, no, it but does make sense. It's, yeah, it's my obvious argument is very aggressive about regionalization mm -hmm. because we're all the town buying equipment based on the same response to, and and you know you're quite right. You have to be able to respond to a low frequency high risk thing, yep. uh, like when high. Yep. 
I mean, every fire truck started to block us there, mm -hmm. uh, which was a great, which was a great example of how regionalization works. Because yeah, somebody brought a ladder truck. I guess we had, we had several. Yes, none of our own. No. So I understand what you're saying. It's just it's a huge amount of money. Um, no, I know. As kind of an insurance policy. Yes. Um, so. Well, your your how your homeowner insurance requires us to do this. Yeah. Otherwise, you solely right. foot the bill. Yes, Whereas, no, absolutely. Yeah. I, I appreciate that. I'm yeah. not, not arguing. Yeah, no, no, no. I'm yeah. just saying that we should, we should look to regionalize really aggressively. Mm -hmm. As as you've done to some extent, we have. Yeah, we have, and 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 uh, right before uh, COVID, uh, we were ready to pull the trigger on uh, taking over two towns, but one town really resisted. And uh, we had to drop the whole thing out because the other town was unreachable without having the town committal. So who knows what will happen in the future? But I'm always looking for that regionalization. Well, I would like to see the hot quotes. S same in hot quotes. Okay. So what about the U ladder? You mentioned that. Yep. Uh, possibility is that not worth looking into. All right. So here's my pick. So something 14, 15 years old, we're going to pay six, seven hundred thousand dollars for. We're going to have to get it refurbished, which is another three hundred thousand. Uh, we're probably not going to be able to get loans for that. Um, and we could be, be buying some of these, you know what? It, it really makes me nervous. But if that the town's willing to do that, I mean, if if it drops an engine or needs a ladder three years down the road. I just don't want to have scorn cast upon you. Well, you will. No matter what. <laughs> <laughs> I, this be real I really don't think it's worth the gamble to pay half the price of a truck on a used truck that's already almost over its service life. That's just me. I understand from what you're saying is that you can't really get a hard no make without making a commitment that you're going to prove right. So I think we're kind of torn there. I do note it's six years today that Pi burned down. Yeah. Oh, is it six? Yeah. Um, the story. Um, so I don't know. I, I, Eric, are you recommending that we get some numbers from you as the ultimate cost or I'm saying well, I mean we can estimate the best we can. I mean I just back the figures uh Chief Green has requested for two is two point nine something million dollars. Uh, I think it'll come in lower than that. Yeah. Uh you take that a twenty year bond talking about hundred and fifty thousand dollars a year before interest. So we'll call it one eighty two hundred thousand dollars a year. Uh, That's over not what that, I mean at the same time we should be banking for the next time this happens, so that we're not. Yeah, and if you put fifty thousand dollars away the next four years, you're gonna have about three hundred thousand dollars. So you, another engine. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. So you're gonna have the first two years coverage. I mean, or you could put away more the next few years. There's, there's ways to do it, but I mean, end of the day, you're looking at around, I'd say, between one fifty to a thousand dollars of a bond per year over the next twenty years for the for two engines. But also, look in the next few years, twenty twenty six, the town garage is paid off. Pentangle is paid off. Uh, 2030, I believe, uh, Irene is paid off. So there are some big ticket items. Uh, we have more to come. <laughs> I know. I know. I know. But I'm here first. So I'm just trying to sell my stuff. <laughs> so what about engine three? Should that be refurbished? Uh, right now, I don't even want to think about it. Um, Better. Yeah. Years. Four years will sneak up on it. But if we order it today, I mean, we'll be sitting pretty good. But I think in three to four years, we should seriously think about pulling the trigger on that one. Refurbishing, buying them. Yeah. That one's been banged up pretty good. Uh, it's a big truck, a lot of torque. Frame rails are super long, as you know, and going over some of our twisty roads. I don't think they're as straight as they used to be. But I can take a good look at it, Greg. And you're well, well, I would love to have your expertise get an eye on too. Well, I say use them all for another 20 years. <laughs> it's too bad. That there's good they have guidelines, but I think they're pushing it myself because it's too, it's too much. It's too much money. I know, but the risk is if it dies, 
then we're it. four years without a truck. Yep. And, and that's where we're getting after, you know, a 25 year old rig. So or as a dump truck sitting in your yard, you can buy, but with a piece of life safety equipment, it's tough. If you were to get it refurbished, you did without an engine. So you got to rely on the neighboring town now. But well, we'd still have a tanker in our shop and an engine down to station two. It, to me, it seems a shame we can't use these at another station. Use what? Use these at another station. <laughs> Why we can't? Why we have to get rid of them? Oh, I mean, if you don't want to, we we don't have to. So if we want to save the 7,500 bucks trade in, we can put them at station two, but then I get into a manpower issue. Who's going to staff them? Who's going to run them? When it does need $10,000 worth of repairs, are you going to let me do that when we are only offered 7,500 bucks of trade in? I know what you're saying, Greg. Sorry, you know? I'm just wondering like if, when, when we expect the OSHA requirement to come, if it is going to come, or is it July, uh, July, January 1st? This coming January? Yes. Okay. Um, the board can vote to approve Chief's request, a different request. They could uh, want some time to think about it and revisit this in a meeting in August. Uh, I don't think a month will make a massive difference, ideally, hopefully, in price. Um, so if you don't feel like you want to make a $3 million decision today, um, you know, you, you can have some, some time and have chief back next month to go over some stuff. Maybe have Robert here as well to answer questions. And, and I can try to squeeze if we're going to look at both at the same time, get some tighter numbers. They're still only going to be estimates. Right. I can do some okay. real crying and kicking and screaming. Yeah. We can try to get some. I'm going to spec out what you can't spec out at all. Unless you that. tell him it's gotta to go to the factory and it's it just takes forever. I'm wondering if yeah, I, I would personally like more time with this decision, but I'm also wondering if there's another way to approach this conversation. And I don't know that this is even possible, Chief, but like if we said like we're comfortable with X amount, would it be possible for then for you go to go back to your specs and see what's doable within that amount? Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. But it's to be honest, we yeah. do not buy fancy rigs. No, yeah. I know, I and I understand. Um, yeah, I I personally would would like to wait for till August and and figure out what more information I need. I agree. Okay. I can try to get some tighter numbers. That would be great. I yeah. think if you tell them that your boards are, you know, your boards difficult yeah. and you're doing the best you can. Yep. I think you should squeeze Bernie a little bit more too. <laughs> he, he never even showed up. It was his people. I was disappointed. So I wanted him to autograph, autograph my parents. <laughs> right, thank you. Um, thank you, just, Chief. As I guess most of the public here tonight, mm -hmm. um, I just want to make a point that this is the kind of thing where I think you probably need to plan a bit of a communication strategy around this. I mean, I assume we have. I assume there's a public vote on on these bonds. Um, so I, I just I think it should be clear that when you come back and revisit this, that it's it's suitably warned and people know that it's that it's going to happen just to so that they're clued in. I, it doesn't sound like there's really that much choice that we have um, based on the externalities. But but I think just in terms of selling this, you you, be, you do well to to. Make sure that people know that this is happening. Okay. okay. Approval of the minutes. Uh, just for a note, um, 5357 521 have already been previously approved, so we don't have to approve those. I have to abstain from 5 2, but I would move we approve 5 1 6 10 6 18 6 20. Five, six, twenty-eight, and six, eighteen. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Motion Aye. for. Yeah. I'll motion. I'll make a motion to approve uh, the minutes for May second. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any other business? 
Motion to adjourn. I move. Second. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. Thank you.